Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really excited to be here, in particular among all uh, the wisdom researchers that I have been reading about and the newsletter you know, that I receive. And so it's really exciting to come together at this uh, Wisdom Research Forum. Um, my talk is about wisdom and well-being. Let's see if I, yeah, this works. And in particular, uh, my question has always been starting actually from my dissertation research over 20 years ago now. Um, how is wisdom related to aging well? Um, I'm a sociologist, but I'm in particularly a life course researcher. And so as a life course researcher, we're looking at uh, old age from the whole perspective of the life course. And so using uh, the principle of human agency and lifespan development, on also the theories of Erickson, uh, Jung, and Maslow, uh, I kind of I propose that well, being in old age is to a large extent the result of psychosocial development and growth across the life course, and I conceptualize this as wisdom. So, um, what might be the relation between wisdom and well-being? So many studies now have shown that wisdom conceptualized as a combination of cognitive, reflective, and compassionate characteristics is positively related to subjective well-being among older adults, uh, but also among uh, younger adults and across the lifespan. Um, but in some regards, this could be seen as a paradox. As Ursula Staudinger has pointed out, um, if you see reality more clearly, you also see the negative aspects of life, and including yourself, and that might lead to some kind of disillusionment, and um, it might be harder to fool yourself that everything is well. Now, I have argued, on the other hand, that if you're wise, you also might have the resources and the capability to cope with the vicissitudes of life. And in fact, I would argue that the association between wisdom and subjective well-being might be stronger under adverse life circumstances. So just very briefly, I want to introduce uh, the three-dimensional wisdom model that I developed based on research by Clayton and Beering in the 1980s, um, where they really came to this model based on implicit wisdom theories. So the cognitive dimension I define as the ability to see reality as it is um, and to understand um, kind of the deeper truths, particularly how it is related to the intrapersonal, interpersonal aspects of life. And in order to get there, you need the reflective dimension, which is defined as looking at phenomena and events from different perspectives, including yourself, which tends to reduce ego-centeredness and uh, helps people to overcome subjectivity and projections, which are the major obstacles in the perception of a more objective truth. And by reducing ego-centeredness and understanding the complexity of the human condition, including um, oneself, the negative aspects of oneself, one develops more tolerance toward others, and that leads to the compassionate dimension, which is defined as sympathy and compassion for others. So, so this is a model that I'm using, and I want to present two results from two studies. Uh, the first is uh, SAGE, the SAGE study that uh, has been conducted uh, under the leadership of Dilip Jeste. It consists of uh, 1,006 older adults with a mean age of 77 years and a median age of 81 years uh, from San Diego County. And again, very briefly, the way I measure wisdom is through the three-dimensional wisdom scale. It's a 39-item scale, self-administered scale. It's a survey item. Um, and um, you can see it measures the cognitive, reflective, and the compassionate dimensions. And then to come up with an overall wisdom score, you compute the average of the three dimensions rather than the 39 items. 
All right, let me present the relation between wisdom, adverse life events, and well-being after controlling for demographic characteristics and subjective health. So what you see is that wisdom was positively related to subjective well-being, and adverse life events was negatively related to subjective well-being, not surprisingly. Adverse life events here were measured as an average of um, the number and the severity of adverse life events during the past year. But there was also an interaction term between wisdom and adverse life events. And this is how the interaction looks like. Well, first of all, as you see here, that there's always a positive relationship between wisdom and subjective well-being, but the effect is stronger for those older adults who had above average adverse life events during the past year compared to those who had no adverse life events. And does this work right? And if you see here, for those older adults who, who were low on wisdom, the difference is most pronounced. Whereas for those older adults who actually were high on wisdom, um, adverse life events had no effect on their subjective well-being on the average. So then I wanted to take a look at how is wisdom related to subjective well-being for people at the end of life. And so my argument here is if wise older adults are able to accept and cope with the finality of life, wisdom might be most beneficial at the end of life when hedonistic and external means to increase subjective well-being largely disappeared. And for the end of life, I'm looking at uh, people who were either residing in a nursing home or were diagnosed with a terminal illness where hospice patients. And so the argument is if you are, at the, if you are in a nursing home or if you are uh, a hospice patient, there is a limited amount what you can do ext extrinsically to increase uh, your subjective well-being. You're like, you know, it's not as easy to go out and go to a restaurant or um, to congregate, meet with other people, even go to church. Everything might be kind of limited. Definitely not traveling anymore. Um, so let me present results from the Aging and Dying Well study that I conducted together with Carla Edwards. This is a study of 156 relatively healthy older adults with a mean age of 71 years and a median age of 72 years. And this was pooled with a study of 18 hospice patients and 23 nursing home residents, which I now call the end of life sample, with a mean and median age of 77 years. And again, I'm gonna show you the relation between wisdom, end of life status, and well-being, controlling for demographic characteristics and subjective health. And what you see again, wisdom is positively related to subjective well-being, end of life status, not surprisingly, is negatively related to subjective well-being, but the effect is stronger for the end of life sample than the community sample. And this is, as before, it's very similar um, for those who were low on wisdom, there is a large difference between the subjective well-being scores. But those who were high on wisdom, it doesn't matter if they were in the nursing home or hospice patients. So then, I just wanted to take a look what might explain the relation between wisdom and subjective well-being. And together, what uh, Etziani and Pushka also looked at this, um, I was looking as, at mastery and purpose in life at, as mediating variables. So wisdom had a positive effect on mastery, the end of life status, a negative effect, not surprisingly. If you're in a nursing home, you have, have less control over your life, or perceive less control. Um, mastery and wisdom had positive effects on purpose in life, and purpose in life had a positive effect on subjective well-being. However, this model, past model only, partially mediated the relationship between wisdom and subjective well-being, so the main effect was still significant. And again, it was stronger for the end-of-life sample than the community sample, but in comparison to the previous model, it was, the direct effect was reduced. So, in conclusion, I want to end with a cite, um, uh, citation by Juvenal, who said, wisdom I know, 
contains a powerful charm to vanquish fortune, or at least disarm. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Have you ever looked at the three dimensions separately in this analysis? Because I was wondering whether one particular dimension was a particularly strong predictor of, of, of well-being in those end-of-life or many life events uh, participants. I have. I have. And quite frankly, if, I, if you really look at it in a lot of detail, uh, what it is, it is this um, the absence of subjectivity and projections in the reflective dimension okay. that has okay. the strongest effect on subjective well-being. Now, the reason why I like to keep it together is that I think wisdom has a lot of effect on variables, but it's not always this reflective dimension that mm -hmm. matters. You know, sometimes it's a different dimension. And so you could say, well, it's only that. Well, it's that for the subjective well-being that matters. But then for other characteristics, it might be more the cognitive dimension mm -hmm. or it might be more the compassionate dimension. So, so I think that wisdom is indeed an integration of those three dimensions. And if you take out the other dimension, it's not wisdom anymore. So that's why I like to keep it together. But you're absolutely right. Thanks, Monica, for a great overview. Um, I wanted to raise a very general question as we start off the day, because we bring together very different disciplines uh, with using very different paradigms to approach wisdom. Um, and we will all use the term wisdom to talk about our work. So I feel if we want to make progress in the field of wisdom research, it is essential uh, that we specify how we operationalize and measure wisdom. And one within the field of the psychology of wisdom, one basic distinction is the distinction between a self-report measure and a performance measure. And there's now more and more evidence accruing that shows that these two different approaches have merits both in their own rights. They don't seem to get at the same construct. And um, when you look at the predictive validity of the different measures, they look very different. So what I would suggest is that as we move forward in our day, that we just be mindful of which kind of approach are we using. Now, in the self-report approach that Monica has invented and has created and developed beautifully over the decades, um, I think one thing which is a great strength of this approach is that it accesses the way people conceptualize for themselves um, their, their, their mastery of the vicissitudes of life. Now, the question for me comes whether mastering the vicissitudes of life in the sense of rebalancing your subjective well-being as adverse events come up and vanish, come up and vanish, whether this is what we would like to call wisdom or whether we would like this to be called mastery, life mastery. Why am I saying this? Because I think when we go to the historical wisdom literature, the wisdom literature is very clear that what sets wisdom apart from other things like coping, intelligence, creativity, social intelligence, is, in my mind, a very unique value orientation that frames the whole um, phenomenon. And this value orientation is for the betterment of the whole, for the betterment of humankind and abstaining from uh, focusing on ourselves. It's the self-transcendence. And, and when I think when one takes this as the centerpiece of the, of the definition and tries to conceptualize a measure that um, tries to capture that, you find a very different predictive validity pattern. And, and so, anyway, I would like us, maybe as we move through the day, really be mindful about these operational differences that we just have, and all of them have great merits. And, um, and 
yeah. And, and the second point I wanted to make is that also for us maybe to think, for, uh, for uh, pragmatic reasons, most of us have approached, including myself, the notion of wisdom as a continuous phenomenon, as a one-dimensional continuous phenomenon. For brevity of language, uh, however, we apply the notion of wisdom for rather low levels of this dimension assuming that it is a one dimension. And I'd like us to reflect upon the fact whether it may not be a one dimension and actually lower levels of wisdom or us approaching higher, us approaching wisdom um, comes with different covariance patterns as compared to the end state. Uh, that is just a, a remark back to your opening statement where you say, um, it is part of wisdom to, you know, be able to move beyond the bitterment and beyond uh, all the sorrow and sadness. This may be the case when we've really, when we are really there. <laughs> I'm not so sure whether we actually, in our work, we have 1,200 wisdom interviews collected over decades. Uh, we just didn't find the highest level in our samples, unselected samples. And so that's the second point I wanted to raise. Is it two qualitatively different phenomena, or uh, can we dutifully really use a one-dimensional approach? Sorry for a long statement. Right, uh, okay. Um, well, first of all, well, thanks so much for this clarification, Ursula. It's, uh, I think we really should keep that in mind, right? This is why I also introduced my wisdom model, and I know we are not all sharing the same model, right? So this is important. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I do first, I do think that wisdom is related to mastery, but it is not the same as mastery. Because I also think that there are people who can master life beautifully, but they are not necessarily, you know, self-transcendent. You know, these are the masters of the universe, you know, that are out there and earn millions of dollars and so on. Um, and, and I wouldn't call those people wise. And this is why I have the combination. So this is why the compassionate dimension of wisdom is very important. This is exactly this, you know, what you were saying. Um, wisdom is good for oneself, others, and society as a whole. So therefore, I think the compassionate dimension, in addition, you know, to the cognitive and reflective are really important. Um, and um, the second point that you were making in terms of, um, remind me, the same. Oh, Oh, well, yes, thank you. Um, yes, I agree with that as well. We have, the cutoff that we have is um, if people score, this is a one to five scale, so if people score f a four or higher on all three dimensions, I would co consider those wise. And there aren't that many, you're absolutely right. But this is why I like to sometimes combine the quantitative research with qualitative research, and particularly extreme case analysis. So I look at those who score really high, like ideally a four on all three dimensions if there are enough, and then look at those and compare them who score under a three as really low, because most people are in the middle, are about between the three and four, right? So they are a little bit wise here and a little bit wise in one dimension, but they are not really completely wise. And then it gets messy. But if you do this extreme case analysis and look at the really wise and those not so wise, you really get interesting results. For example, how wise people cope with crisis and obstacles in life. You really get some interesting things. Thank you for that presentation in the, in the last exchange, which I found quite fascinating. And it seems to me that there are a number of different issues uh, that are uh, related, interrelated, and uh, sort of tangled. And one issue is self-transcendence, and there's mastery, the reflective component of your model, and the compassion component of your model. Uh, in order to be wise, and I, I consider wisdom to be sort of an achievement, uh, I'm not sure that we positively strive for it, but it's something that we seem to increase or, or remain neutral in or decrease in over the years. But in terms of self-transcendence, how far do we have to go in order to achieve wisdom? I mean, how far? I mean, your, your reflective model suggests moving beyond egocentrism. The wisdom literature, I think, suggests moving toward the divine, which is a considerably farther way to go. Um, mastery, I'm wondering about different senses of mastery, and I think, you know, I'm anxious to hear the Buddhist wisdom, because sometimes uh, we master things by not mastering, just by letting go, and that's wisdom. Um, 
So I just offer these not really as a question, but as a, a sort of ongoing puzzlement about the various dimensions of uh, concepts that come up here. Right. And, and if I can just, uh, just reply to that briefly, you're absolutely right. So when we did this comparison between the high wisdom scores and the low wisdom scores, one of what the high wisdom scores did indeed to uh, cope with crisis and obstacles in life was they did active coping as much as they could, right? As much as it was in their capacity. But if there was something they could not do, they were also then ready to let go. And that was then the part where they said, okay, I couldn't do anything, I just pray, right? Because again, God will take care. But it is really the motto, you know, God helps those who help themselves. And whereas the one who were low, they started to pray right away. You know, they were just, okay, I'll just pray for it. They didn't even try to do the mastery part. Um, so you're absolutely right, you know, so that there are, and, and the divine, that's, a, my model I think is more secular. There, that could be a discussion, you know, is it related to the divine or not? Or can you have wisdom without being religious? And I think you can have this um, humanistic kind of wisdom, you know, where you're still concerned about uh, the good of others and the good of the universe, um, but you don't necessarily believe in religion and spirituality. I was interviewing one person, and actually I had only one in my sample, who was high on wisdom but low on, on, on intrinsic spirituality. And that's exactly what he said. He was a scientist and he said, I just can't believe in this stuff. It just doesn't make sense to me. But at, for all other practical purposes, he was a humanist. He really cared about others. So, you know, that would be another discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much.